Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today on UVM's Continuing in Distance Education Food as Therapy webinar. I'm super excited for this discussion today. Um, food is one of my favorite things to prepare, to talk about, and to share with friends and family. So this is going to be a really exciting opportunity to hear um, from our panelists today. Um, so we're going to go through a quick introduction. So I'll go through the agenda. We're going to talk about cooking and eating, the psychological framework, um, cooking and eating for comfort. We all have those comfort foods that we tend to go to. And so why are they so comforting? I don't know if you've ever asked that question, so we're going to tackle that today. Culinary tips. Um, we would not have a course and a webinar without offering some knowledge and some information that hopefully you can continue to use. And so we have a quick video today on pie crust making. So hopefully you'll learn how to do that if that has not been in your repertoire of things that you are doing in the kitchen. Maybe after today you will. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about a new course that's just launching at the University of Vermont in our Continuing in Distance Education Department Culinary Nutrition. So we're going to tell you a little bit about that. And to continue the learning opportunity, we are offering a digital badge for participation today. And I'll explain a little bit more about that as well. Just some logistics for our folks joining us on YouTube today. Uh, questions, if you have questions and comments, please add them to the chat box. I'll keep an eye on that. And our team member, Kelly, will share questions back over to us in our webinar platform. And we'll get those um, answered, hopefully, for you today. And if there's a question we don't get to, we'll also put our email address up so that we can follow up. you can follow up with us as well. We are recording this, so we will share it afterwards. And I suspect people may want to know the pie crust making recipe, so we will share that um, after the webinar also. So thank you so much for being with us. My name is Nicola Willier Fenton. I work at the UVM's Continuing and Distance Education Department. And I'm so happy to have our dean of our Department of Continuing and Distance Education, Cynthia Bellavo, is with us today. Cynthia, thank you so much for being with us. And also, we are so fortunate that Cynthia has um, recruited one of her longtime friends and a licensed psychologist and a former instructor also at UVM in our College of Education and Social Services. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. And we're really looking forward to this discussion. So starting us out today, I wanted to um, toss over to the both of you in terms of um, why we're even having this discussion. And I think many of us saw um, lots and lots of posts and, and the shortage of flour. You know, all these things that were happening when we were home and in uh, quarantine, there was a, a need or an urge to connect over food or to get your hands into dough and to maybe try something that you hadn't tried before. Um, and so I want to just pass over to both Cynthia and Eric is that really what, what, what we, you were finding as well? And were you starting to question, why? Why is this um, that in a time of isolation, food continues to connect us? So I think that there's a psychology to it that Eric is going to talk about first, and then I'll move into what I think the culinary piece is. Eric. Sure, sure. Um, well, I, I love food. And I love to cook. Um, so it's been uh, fun for me as well as a good exercise to really focus my thinking on what is the connection between uh, food preparation or cooking and uh, eating and our mental health and, and well-being. And I found it helpful in my thinking to, um, to go back to an old framework in psychology. Um, it's called, the framework is called the three forces of psychology. And uh, the first force, um, when I say force, I'm really talking about a way of thinking about what um, motivates us as humans. Where does our behavior come from? What are the roots of our behavior? So there, over, over the past century, there have been three major ways of kind of thinking about that. And these, these ways are not mutually exclusive. But the first force of psychology or first framework is Freudian psychology or psychoanalytic uh, psychology. And this force posits that a lot of our, our behaviors, a lot of who we are stems from our very, and some of that, some of our behavior thus becomes 
uh, unconsciously motivated. We're not even clear about why we feel as we do or behave as we do. So that's the first force of psychology. And when I think about food in relation to this force, I think about um, foods that for us are associated with those very early years, um, perhaps food that our parents or other family, member, other family members made and that we ate together. Um, we might in fact call those comfort foods, things that uh, evoke in us those pleasant, wonderful feelings. We may not understand where they come from, but we know that they're there and they're very powerful. So that's the first force of psychology. Second force of psychology is called behaviorism, or more in, in a more modern term is cognitive behaviorism. And the, the main principle here is the principle of learning. Um, this says that um, you know, we used to think that learning was the result of reward and punishment. But now, of course, we know that learning is greatly affected by how we think. Um, about those things that are going around, going on around us and, and from which we learn. So here I think about um, food that we, uh, food experiences that we had uh, when we were growing up, food experiences that we gone, we've gone through and consequently learned from. Um, what did we learn in these years that we've lived to date about cooking and about food and about eating? Um, you know, I grew up on a, on a farm and uh, I never had anything like spaghetti and meatballs until I was a pre-adolescent. And I thought, whoa, this is really something. This is a new experience for me. And I remember having chow mein, Asian food, for the first time. Um, I remember as an adult having blue cheese. And for me, blue cheese had been Velveeta. Um, even though I grew up on a farm, we never had um, cheese. So that, those were new experiences. And I think here about not only what we have learned, but what we can continue to learn um, as our lives move along. What new uh, experiences and adventures can we have with food? And the third force of psychology is what's called humanism. And humanism posits that human beings are born with the innate potential for being good and positive and loving beings. Um, and if we nurture that innate goodness um, as people grow up, then they will become loving and compassionate human beings, wanting to share with others and be kind and good to others. And of course, here's where I think about sharing food, um, making food and giving it to other people, sharing food with your, with your community, maybe even making food for people you don't even know and that you contribute somehow to, uh, to their well-being. So those are three different ways of sort of relating to and thinking about cooking and food. And Eric, if I'm thinking about the Freudian piece of this, um, I think about um, that a good a geneticist friend of mine talked about that palate, the way that you taste and smell, is set by 10 years old, and that mm -hmm. you need to evolve and push yourself after that. But the way you taste, and then I, I just read a, an article where they were testing the amniotic fluid of pregnant women. They gave them a lot of garlic, and they could smell it in the amniotic fluid. So what's happening even in utero is affecting the way that we taste and the way that we are, are positioned towards um, what we like and dislike. So I think that that's a fascinating um, perception that we are not even aware in many cases of what we consider to be foods that we like and what's comfortable. Right, and what you say I think supports that idea of, you know, we may grow up learning, uh, experiencing certain foods that become our comfort foods, and we may have to push ourselves a little bit later That's to right. expand, our, right. expand our food horizons. Right. Yeah. But I think that back when we were first talking about this course, it was in the middle of March, and things were dreary and dark, and we'd all been sort of shocked out of our system to in this new way of being. And then suddenly, all of our habits of cooking and eating were just greatly disrupted. Um, and what I watched is, you know, the plethora of people of um, sharing recipes, you know, every single feed was putting new recipes up. There was this bread baking mania that we saw. So I think it's interesting that people, once they were sequestered and couldn't go out and were afraid to go to the grocery store, that this, this cooking, this interesting cooking started to happen. And there's also oh, yeah. been, sub go ahead. We've been thinking about that, talking about that. My partner and I are both retired, and a central focus of our life now is what we're going to have for dinner. <laughs> yes, I know, exactly. 
So, but I think that now that summer's here, it's kind of fading a little bit. But I think that a lot of people have learned. I was even thinking, I was reading an article recently where that they didn't like the experience. People didn't, some people loved the experience, but some people didn't like the experience of cooking and being forced to, but then had a real appreciation for the people who cook for them. So the restaurateurs, their mothers, their their spouses, their partners, that somebody's actually doing that for them every day. And there was a new appreciation having to do it. So, um, but I think what we're talking about today, um, as far as cooking and eating, and it really does cut across all ethnicities and cultures, that breaking bread is universal. Um, and as I said, whether you like it or not, uh, we all need to eat. And so this centering, that's what I want, that's what I'm excited to explore today is what does cooking and eating, how does that center us when you feel disrupted like this? So talk about, yeah. go ahead. I was just going to ask, um, one of the things that I found really interesting is when we're so busy, before we were quarantined and we were going along in our ways and ordering this and ordering that and going out to dinner, I, I always looked to my pantry as so many different things that I had in there that I didn't always know what to do with. <laughs> and so um, I, I had kind of challenged myself to eat down the pantry, eat down the freezer, um, and in really explore the things that maybe I'd gotten in a CSA share that I threw in the freezer of you know goat meat and things like that. And so while at times it was intimidating and exhausting um, to be preparing three meals a day for four people um, and snacks in between, seems like my kids had a bottomless pit for snacks during all of this, um, it was kind of satisfying to take the time to challenge myself um, to, to go outside my comfort zone with cooking. And, and I don't know if a lot of people felt that way as well, but um, I just wanted to see your thoughts on, on, on that experience, too. Well, I am. Um, One thing I, I was. Um, with my, I was, I was teaching um, in the foods lab at UVM when this hit, and we had to abruptly move the students from in class foods lab to online. And so we had to come up with a lot of different exercises. And one was to go into your pantry and and figure it out. And it was fascinating what they came up with. So that I, I really like that exercise of of having to. And now with with um, being able to look at recipes online, you can plug in. You know, I've got um, I've got canned pumpkin and uh, anchovies. What can I make? They're not always so good. But. It's been a good exercise for me too, because I'm one who tends to cook my recipes and my partner is much more creative. And uh, he always says, you are the boss of the food. You are the boss of the food. Um, don't, don't be afraid to explore. So I really, uh, I've become a little more facile in exploring and finding um, out what you can substitute for um, certain yeah. things. Substitutions became a huge, a huge deal. Thank goodness for Google with that. <laughs> right. Well, thank goodness for that. Do you want to touch on, um, Eric, maybe touch on why that feels good, too, is just, you know, I, I think about the experience that before this and, and hopefully coming back to it after working, coming home, and while I don't always want to cook, once I get into it, it feels very relaxing and it just feels somewhat therapeutic for me with a glass of wine and, and you know maybe because I know the system and I know the process but I'm also allowed so that creativity um, it, it, maybe walk us through what is the psychology of making food and the experience that people have as it feeling good well you know I'll, I'll go back for a minute to that to the framework I mentioned that um, part of the feeling good maybe that we're making foods that just nurture our souls that make us feel really good. They, they, they feel wonderful to make and to eat. That happens for me when I bake bread. My mother and my grandmother were wonderful bread bakers. And now, boy, I make bread a couple times a week because it just feels really good to me to do that. Um, I think for some other people, learning may be what is really comforting and helps to manage stress. So learning to, you know, going online and finding new recipes or buying new cookbooks, um, there can be a certain satisfaction that comes from learning. And then that whole experience of making food to share, wow, that is really, 
one powerful um, antidote to anxiety and depression. And Cynthia, you have interesting information about why some foods, foods feel really good to us. Yeah, well, with a, with a, we are getting to that slide, but I want to just talk quickly about the senses because I think that the, the um, sensualness of making food with your hands and also tasting it is something that, um, as you were talking about, Eric, uh, the other day was uh, neurologically pleasing, that when we actually use our hands to do something, there is something that happens to the brain. And with taste, you know, this sensory experience, and again, this happens with my students all the time because most of the time we mindlessly eat and, and we don't stop long enough to actually inhale, put something on the palate, allow the, the mouth to warm up and to, through the olfactories um, and taste buds, you are actually getting a different experience. And when we think about salt, sweet, sour, bitter, umami or the savory flavor, um, we, don't, we don't compartmentalize that. We don't try to really understand in most cases. And it's a learned thing. So when we were sequestered and you actually were given some time to think about these things and to experience it, I think that there's a deeper appreciation, which then creates a calmer, a calmer perspective um, and situation for us. So I just think that we need to remember that Slowing down, being mindful, and actually tasting the food after you've made it is a is a a nice cycle of um, almost meditative cycle. So um, you also I want to mention, go ahead. You also mentioned using our hands, and just recently I read this wonderful short piece um, about a uh, a Native American. Uh, it's a, a Native American idea. A young Native American woman asked her grandmother. Grandmother, what do I do about pain? How do I deal with pain? Which is certainly relevant during this, uh, this time right now. And the grandmother said, you need to use your hands. You need to use your hands and do things with your hands because your hands are connected to your soul. And when you use your hands and connect to your soul that way, the pain doesn't go away, but it makes it more tolerable. Mm -hmm. I thought that was just a, a really wonderful right. image. And I also think that there's a lot to food memory. I mean, you can have bad memories as well, but when you're thinking about food memory, um, whatever it is, uh, you, need to, you need to embrace that because I think sometimes we have secret pleasures or things that we might feel embarrassed about. They're not fancy enough or they're not, they're not current, um, but we need to go back to those foods so that you are, you are reconnecting with with your past and um, and getting that centering that happens. So I, I highly so what recommend. Is, what is one of those for you? Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm going to reveal. Um, my um, my father was um, his grandfather was from Nova Scotia, and they used to have fish, a lot of fish, and then they had beans. They grew a lot of beans, so they used to do a fish and bean, fresh fish and you know, homemade beans. But when he, when he immigrated to the US and it was during the depression, it became tuna fish and canned baked beans. That is still mm. something that I love. That combination is just delicious. And my husband, when I first married him, we was like, oh, that is so disgusting. And now he'll say, let's do that. So we, we eat it now. So, you know, who knows? It's just what, what brings back that emotion for you? What about you? That's so funny because my ancestors, my on my mother's side, came from Nova Scotia as well, as you know. And for me, one of the things we had growing up, and I think they probably had some version of it when she was a kid, is tuna pea wiggle, tuna yeah. Um, yeah. And peas in a white sauce on crackers. Oh, we had it just the other night. It's so comforting. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, what about you? I know I was thinking about some of the good food memories and some of the bad ones, too, um, that I have. And I'll share a bad one, um, since you guys were on the positive side. Um, I had a real challenge with um, a summer squash, which now I love it. But my grandmother had made a squash casserole. 
And I think it just, you know, the consistency and the texture is so much, it plays an impact on you, I think, especially as a child. Oh, um, yeah. Bad mouthfeel. Yeah, the mouthfeel of the squash and the casserole just honestly probably really scarred me <laughs> to today. So, yeah, you can get a lot of But, it was but a they're usually fun. funny. It, and I appreciate it. One of the things that I do draw on from that memory is that she um, made that from the squash she grew in her garden. So I was always appreciative and in awe of what she would do with a small um, garden space at her camp um, as well. So um, while I tried my best to eat it, um, it, it wasn't very successful. That's it. Yeah. So let's, let's move a little bit, guys, to um, cooking for, for comfort. You know, we've talked about the memories and the food that makes us think good and think bad memories. Um, but I do think that there's something to, um, I love the story that you shared, Eric, about using your hands. Um, and we'll ha we have a video coming up in a few minutes that will showcase Cynthia teaching us how to make um, a pie crust. And I think sometimes something as simple, which now you've taught me, can be very simple, but it's intimidating sometimes to, for people to, to get in and to try something like that um, uh, on their own, especially when there's options in the freezer at the store. Um, so maybe, Eric, come back to why do you think that that grandmother was sharing with that grandson about use your hands and the feeling um, that, that some of the points that you're making here on this slide? Well, that's, that's a really good question, and I'm, I'm not sure. I'm sure there's some physiological uh, aspect to that as well, but I think it's, it's in the doing um, that something really special happens. Um, I remember once years ago, reading someone, some theoretician who said if you're if you're down and depressed and you can't you kind of don't feel like living is worth going on, get down and wash the mop boards in your house. Get down and be physical. Do something. So there's some you know it, it changes our physiology when we when we become active. Um, so I think it's in the in the doing um, that happens. Cynthia, that's your really your area too is well I mean learning by doing yeah, I, I think that seasonal or abrupt, uh, a sort of abrupt changes can create food cravings, and there are good examples of that tight link between food and our hormones. Um, so comfort foods are generally high in fat and carbs, and they can increase serotonin production and thus a feeling of well-being, um, uh, making us uh, making them sort of a natural pick for anybody who's feeling depressed because they're physically comforting and neurologically pleasing. So there's nothing like, um, for some people, a, a pint of Ben and Jerry's to make them feel better. Um, and that stress repon that responses vary, but they're directly linked to food intake. So when we're stressed, our body initi initiates a a flight or um, uh, a, a fight or flight response, and then when that stress occurs, these hormones are released, and these hormones then stay in the blood long after uh, the stressors removed, and and then it gets replenished. And even stressors, they, they even stresses like that require little energy, like like the COVID not knowing, not that just sense of not knowing and what was going to happen next and the economic pressures and 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 then all that's happened since then and the the just the wear and tear on our on our psyches as we're experiencing um, covid and then all that's all the social unrest afterwards there is our our um, brain doesn't recognize the difference between something like this and House burning down. We still have those same releases, and they deplete our energy stores, and then we have a carb craving. So, so know that. Um, and foods high in sugar, salt, fat appear to elicit a very strong response for our endorphins. So you want to make sure that you know you're 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 comforting yourself, but you're also watching that. Um, that doesn't become a vicious cycle. And now, you know, you're hearing a lot of, I just had a friend call me the other day and said that she's now gained the COVID-19. Um, and, and then what that means as a result of that kind of stress and feeling, um, you know, that strong defense mechanism. I think also bread making is part of that, Eric, when you were talking about making bread. That is something that is both a carb 
it's physical. And I also think that the sourdough piece of it for me, I mean, I, my, my daughter gave me some, some sourdough starter and I felt, felt like I was taking care of a baby. Um, I had to feed it at twice, a, uh, twice a week. I had to make sure that it was, it was alive and doing well. I mean, just the fact that I had to focus on something else besides myself during that crisis, during the crisis continued, has given me a sense of, I don't know, purpose, almost like washing the floor, like feeding that sourdough was something that was really important to me. And then kneading it, touching it, making sure that it was going to be okay. Make, you know, it was a long process. You have to do it over a period of 12 hours. I mean, I think that's why we saw so much so much sourdough baking um, of, of bread during that time. Mm. Mm. Eric, do you have some perspective on that as well? No, no, it's just good. It's just affirming to hear. Some. Well, and I think also I warm foods, you know, because now when I we're a little bit more about why you feel that way. <laughs> but I mean, think about like yes. a warm bowl of soup or any of those things. Like they just make us feel there's a sense of satiety that happens as a result. So. Yeah. Um, we yes. do have um, a, a fresh question. sugar donuts that just come out. Right? Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I, in, I do want to make note, um, one of our listeners and viewers on YouTube said that, you know, trying to reduce that sugar, and, uh, and I think that's always a good thing to be mindful of it because we have too much in our, um, in our American diet. Um, but question for you here, Cynthia. Um, uh, it looks like Daniel, Daniel is asking, um, I believe there are natural substances that can create a sweet flavor without affecting psychological health. Is that true? Well, what is it, stevia? There's... Uh, I think agave. There's some sweet sweeteners that you can use to, to, uh, to get that. But I also think that Madiha. Oh no, we can hear you, Cynthia. Okay. Um, I also think that um, that having um, I can't see you, so I'll just keep talking. Um, also. Um, this concept of how much sugar you should be eating or how much sweet you should be eating, I think that there's ways to to um, mitigate that without doing away with it. Um, so I, I, I'm always thinking about um, meeting people where their palates are. And if it's too restrictive or you're trying to reduce too much, then there's a, a lack of compliance and then you're not feeling comforted. So working with um, someone who can help you figure out what palate type you are, that is one thing we're going to be doing in the course a lot, is think, think, thinking about the different palate types and what makes people happy um, to be able to stay compliant. So you know, have a little ice cream, have some maple syrup, um, be able to do those things to, hit, uh, to uh, give you that sense of um, comfort. Thank you I, for sharing that. I also find for myself, I love sweets, but I'm learning that I can be happy with just a small piece of cake or a small bowl yeah. of ice cream. I don't have yeah. to deprive myself. You know, very sweet tea, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Eric, let's come back here as well, just talking about the psychology of isolation. And one of the things, you know, Cynthia is referring to the sharing of the sourdough starter. Um, we, we as Americans and, you know, in our culture, we, we like to share and, and food is something that, you know, I think about the, I, that's one of the things I love to do. You know, I, I tend to feed people when they come into my home. I, I, do you want something to eat? Can I get you some cheese? Do you want a glass of wine? Um, and so not having that, uh, was, was interesting and difficult. Um, and, and I imagine that, that sense of community was a little missing for people in isolation. So maybe talk about what that is um, in terms of our um, psyche and, and how we need that as well and how food plays a key role in it. You know, if you look at the research about um, how people thrive, um, you know, there's a whole field of psychology now called positive psychology. Psychology in its early years always looked at what was wrong with people? What uh, what what pathologies were evident? Um, why did people not function well? And more recently, we've begun to look at what 
what makes for really healthy people, what makes for healthy behavior. And um, one of the things we know that, that really uh, helps people function well, helps people thrive, is doing for others. Um, a friend of mine used to say, said that his mother used to say, if you're, uh, if you're down and out, go do something for somebody else. And you know, that's, there's really strong research now that um, supports that idea that by doing for others, um, we end up feeling better ourselves. We feel less depressed, we feel less anxious. And even in this time where there's a lot of isolation and we can't be close to people the way we used to be or the way we'd like to be, we can still do things for others. We can still find ways to be kind um, and to do for others. So I, I, I always think um, kindness is never a mistake. If you can find ways to be kind, even little ones, that really decreases our sense of isolation and our loneliness and perhaps our, our, our feelings of depression and anxiety. Well, I was really struck by the humanism um, piece of, of, of the psychological framework because that's what I've seen the most. That's what I've seen happen the most. I think in our, in our fear and, and almost rage that we're feeling, um, there is this sense of community that's, that's become very, very strong. And how you connect to your farmers, you know, supporting your local farmers. I mean, in Vermont, we have a lot of them, and they are hurting right now. How do you, uh, CSAs are sold out. Um, you can see people just wanting to have more of a local connection to, to the food that they're eating. And I also think that COVID has started to, to sort of bring us to the point of realizing that possibly globalization was not the be-all and end-all of what we thought um, it could provide. And so pulling back, being forced to pull back, to be more in your community, to be more in your own home, I think has has had this effect of, of trying to um, make sure that our food supply is also close by. Mm -hmm. um, let's uh, take a moment here. We're going to pause for a moment. Um, we're going to turn off webcams in just a second. But I wanted to let everybody know, um, and Cynthia, before you go, um, I want you to give us a little um, prelude as to what we're about to see. Um, before um, we were all uh, sent from campus and, and working remotely, we were in the midst of filming um, different modules and different um, cooking techniques in the upcoming culinary nutrition course. And so, um, Cynthia, we had the pleasure of filming um, a pie making um, video <laughs> with you, and that's what we're going to see. But give us a little bit of a, why a pie? Why are we showing um, making a pie crust? Well, it's summer, so, you know, pies are, you, pies are on the cover of all magazines and on every single website at this point because they're extremely versatile. There's berry pies and peach pies and delicious rhubarb right now. Eric makes an amazing rhubarb pie. And um, so, so, and a pie is kind of this iconic thing, you know, where you, do, you always see, at least, at least in our, in our imagination, you always see somebody bringing a pie to a new neighbor, when somebody has a baby, let me get this sort of a celebratory thing. Um, so why not learn how to make a pie? It's really easy and we've made it into this complicated thing that it's not. And I was talking to Eric before about my, my mother and her sister competed for who made the best pie crust and who used Crisco versus who used butter and who used part butter and I mean, it was this fascinating and wonderful family argument that um, I still think about. And believe it or not, my aunt, don't tell my mother, but um, my aunt's was better, and she used Crisco. So. <laughs> <laughs> and what I really appreciate about working with you on the filming of this and then watching the video again and prepare, um, pre preparing for this is that a pie crust shouldn't be that intimidating. And, and for oh. me, many folks it was. And it was just almost simple to just grab the frozen one um, at the grocery store. But when we couldn't do that, right, um, then, and then what do you do? And you, you try to rely back on learning how to do this yourself. Um, yeah. And so you have demystified, I think, the pie crust, Cynthia. And so well, I would say, it, you know, don't be, just don't, this, 
it's the world is sad right now. It just feels sad. I feel sad. And um, and so make a pie. Mm, just just practice. And the key to making a good pie crust is just don't touch it too much. Don't work with it too much. Um, let it let it speak to you. And then with an act of kindness, take it someplace. On that note, we're going to turn off our webcams for just a minute. We'll be back with you. Stick around. This is about a six minute instructional video about making a pie crust and then rolling out the pie crust and then we'll come back and we'll talk just things that we can um, do with that pie crust. So stay with us. We'll be back on camera. So today I'm going to um, make a pie crust, just one pie crust for about a nine inch uh, pie. And a pie crust is one of those basic things that you should know how to make. It's extremely easy. It's the technique that, that usually gets to be complicated. But it is, um, you know, you use a pie crust for anything sweet, blueberry, apple, peach pie. You also use it for um, a quiche. You also can use it for a chicken pot pie. So it's a really nice thing to have in the back of your mind. Relatively few ingredients. So I have uh, six tablespoons of unsalted butter. I have a quarter of a teaspoon, a quarter of a cup of very, very cold ice water. I have uh, one cup of flour, a little bit of salt, and I have my utensils, my um, the tools that I'm going to do to be able to cut the butter. So it's a basically it's a, a, a pretty easy recipe. So the first thing that I'm going to do is put the flour into the bowl. And you can see that my mise en place is completely set up and ready. I'm then going to add the butter chunks, a little bit of salt. And I'm going to break it up. And this is a pastry cutter. If you don't have a pastry cutter, you can use two knives and just do that. But you're basically going to just break this butter into the flour. And the key to a good pie crust is to not get it warm. Because if you have butter chunks that are still left, they melt out. And in between the pockets where they melt, they create space, which then you get flakiness. And that is the key to a good pie crust. So you want to just keep working it. Till you can start to see that it forms like little peas. You get the idea. It should look like this. And then you're going to slowly add the butter, I mean the water. And this is something that I find it's hard to do if you're not using your hands. I mean you could, if you wanted to, use a spoon, but I think that in order to be able to get this to be mixed, you kind of need your hands to feel it. Okay, and you don't necessarily have to use all the water, and sometimes you need, need a little bit more, but it should come together, not smoothly. And then once you get a sense of it, you'll have what they call a shaggy ball. And this will just be how it is until It refrigerates for a while. It should look messy. And then what you're going to do, in order for this dough to gelatinize, you're going to want it to refrigerate for a while. And you'll refrigerate it for about, I mean, this can stay in the refrigerator for a good 24 hours, but um, 
a good 20 minutes to 40 minutes, we'll get the right gelatinization, and then we'll roll it out next. OK, so the pie, pie crust has properly gelatinized in the refrigerator. And now it's time to roll it out. Okay, so we have a nice crust here. Put a little flour down. Put a little flour on the rolling pin. And if it starts to stick, just put a little more on here. I'm going to try to roll it out the edges and try not to go off the edge. Because when you go off the edge, you make the, um, the pie crust um, will have different edges. And so you want to make sure that it's staying at an even thickness. And you can see the little butter chunks in here. That's a good sign. And you'll just keep rolling this until you get it to the right size. And you can start to pinch your edges together. It's very forgiving. Okay, and this is about ready to add to the pan. We'll have Cynthia and Eric turn back on webcam to join us as well. Um, the thing that really struck me about um, when I was working with Cynthia on filming that and also watching it again is that it, it is pretty simple to make a pie crust. And um, so I, I think um, one of the things that we can remember and maybe learn from this experience of being home in quarantine is maybe not be intimidated by some of the things in the pantry um, when it's just as easy to make your own. If you can find flour. That was a challenge, right? Um, but if you can find flour, it, it's pretty easy to make a pie crust. Um, and then your possibilities really are kind of endless. Um, Cynthia, do you want to share anything um, as a result of watching that again? Oh, Cynthia, I don't have your mic on. Um, you were on, but now I don't hear you. So. One sec. On? There you are. OK, so say that again. You were doing something with your hand. I said, I, I wish that I had um, I had shown how to put it in the pan. I, I didn't realize that I didn't do that. But You need to know, come to the class. We're going to do it in class. Oh, actually, online, but yes. Mm -hmm. Eric, we're not hearing you. You want to turn back on your microphone as well, Eric. Um, and maybe while we're waiting for Eric to turn that back on, um, I do want to share um, what class that is um, that you're referencing and what we were filming for um, a, a new course, a brand new course um, coming up here in a few weeks, um, a, a little, a little less than a month away on July 6th, um, and it's called Culinary Nutrition. And Cynthia, do you want to just touch on um, what are the concepts and then how will um, students learn those concepts in the course? Well, as a faculty member in nutrition and food science, um, they and I'm not a nutritionist. Um, um, so for me, I, I'm a chef. So I think about food in a different way. And um, the chair of the department, uh, Jean Harvey, who's written a lot of books and 
uh, invented a lot of different know-hows for behavior modification when it comes to um, diet and health. Uh, we were talking, and she said, you know, there's a lot of people out there who know the, the, um, the nutritional facts of how to do this, how to, you know, what you should eat, here are the recipes of what you should be eating, but they actually don't know how to cook, and they also don't have any sense of the sensory piece in doing substitutions or the way food should taste and how to make food taste the way that um, you want it to taste. They don't have good product ID. They don't understand the difference in herbs, uh, how to use spices, all of those things. Because, and therefore, they're, they're not good at, at then um, consulting with either their clients or, or working with their family or other members. Um, of, of their community. So it, got, it gave us the idea. And now the course is 100% online. And I've done a lot more videos than that and gotten much better at them. Um, but now um, the course will be in July. And we will go through, I think it's four weeks of coursework, which will involve a lot of cooking. And a lot of collaboration, I would imagine. A lot of collaboration. Amazing amount of collaboration, yes. Can be done. And now, can I, now my mic is on. Can I ask my question? Please. Cynthia, how did you how do you put the crust in the pan? I know. I just said that when that I I should have shown that. I just um, well, some people fold it in quarters and then lay it in, and but I just lift the whole thing and then just make it fit. Okay. Not okay. hard. Yeah. Well, look at your pie crust. Your your pie crusts are beautiful. You know how to do it. You know, when, when my mother died, she was 80, and she died a number of years ago. But at her funeral, the main theme of the minister's talk was the fact that my mother always made pies for everybody um, in her community. She was always delivering pies. Um, yeah. And I thought, what a good way to be remembered. <laughs> yeah. I'm kidding. Yeah. Um, um, Cynthia, I wanted to ask a quick question. We had a comment um, in the chat box um, about using different types of flour. And I think that's an interesting... Um, experience, experiment that people could have is, you know, oat flowers or, you know, different whole wheat flowers. Um, what is your advice um, as to how to uh, manipulate and work a pie crust with different types of flowers, too? Well, with a pie crust, you don't want a high gluten flour, so you would never use um, bread flour because you don't want the proteins of the gluten um, to, to create any kind of uh, density or stretchiness, which we do want in bread. Uh, so my recommendation is an all-purpose flour that seems to work fine. And I'm a big fan of King Arthur. They've got a variety of different ones, but all-purpose for. And as far as gluten-free pie crust, um, my son has been, recently been diagnosed as a gluten intolerant, which was really a shock to all of us. But he's been experimenting with some of the gluten-free products from King Arthur. And uh, he just made a pizza dough the other day that was really delicious. I mean, you have to not think of it as, as a gluten pizza dough. You have to think of it as this different product. But it was fantastic. So I think experimentation with different kinds of flours for those for, for your dietary considerations is, is completely doable today. Thank you for that perspective. I do want to just make mention of what's on the screen right now. Um, for folks that have joined us today, we are offering a digital badge for participation. We hope that you have learned um, at least how to make a pie crust today and feel a little bit braver about giving it a try. Um, and so we want to give you a digital badge for participation and your um, opportunity to learn with us today. A little bit of information on the screen as to how it works. Um, Kelly will add a link into the chat box um, on YouTube as to where the landing page is so that you can go claim your badge. We will also send that link out in the follow-up email with the recording from today. And when we do post the video on our YouTube channel, we'll also include the link um, for folks to claim their badge for participation. Our questions have kind of um, slowed down over on um, YouTube. But I do want to um, recognize that Daniel had a follow-up question earlier as well. He was asking. Um, when we were asking about uh, sugar and sweet alternatives, he was saying natural healthier sugar associations 
uh, for when elderly have decreased senses, but they can still pick up on sweets. As a nursing student, I want to be able to assist my patients. Any mm -hmm. thoughts, Cynthia, on, on how um, Daniel might be able to navigate that? And so we are, um, well, we have our emails here because I could do some email exchanges, but in the course, we're actually talking about palate types, and we are talking about the, the super taster or fussy, and then we're also talking about sort of the average, but then we're talking about um, uh, palate compromised. And what do you do in those situations when somebody is palate compromised? And what, what um, flavoring you need to do to, to, uh, to make that person feel that sense of, um, of, of comfort and satiety. So if you leave me your, uh, if you email me, I will be glad to talk more about that with you. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. And we'll put up the learn email address as well over in YouTube. Um, and if there's any questions that we haven't gotten to today and you want to follow up, please let us know. We also have a great question from Brenda. What books would you suggest to learn more about food and physiology? I would really like to learn more, and I work with the elderly, which seems to be a theme today, yeah. which is so wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Eric, do you have any thoughts on that as well? I think that says food and psychology. Is that right? Oh, psychology, um, yeah. Yes, I, I can think of a couple books. I can't, I can't um, recall the actual titles or author now, but again, if that person wanted to send us the email, I would be glad to respond to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you for that. Um, and we also have a question, too. Um, Daniel was asking, uh, is the course only available for the summer? Will it be offered again? It's the first time we're offering yeah. it this summer. So yeah, we we're planning on doing it again. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Great. Let me just make sure that we're um, in pretty good. Uh, oh, Brenda asks, elderly are often isolated and experiencing depression. And I want to suggest that they cook with someone to make sure they're participating in the cooking. And, and that's certainly something that we have heard the theme today is to um, take part in the community of food as well. Yeah, and I would say with children as well, um, teenagers. I have found that there is an um, innate interest in making food. Uh, and I've taught I've taught little children all the way to um, to uh, the elderly, and there is just an innate interest in cooking and then uh, eating together. So, highly recommend that as a community pr uh, a practice and, and an act of kindness. That's great. Thank you so much for that. And we are getting more requests for book titles. So why don't um, Cynthia and Eric and I will follow up and please do email us um, at learn uh, at uvm.edu. And we'll also include in our follow-up email some of those title recommendations from our panelists today. That's a great question and suggestion. So I want to thank everyone for joining us and taking time out of your busy day to learn about food as therapy and maybe feel a little braver about trying a pie crust. I know I do, so thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> and thank you, Eric, for your insight today. And I really appreciate the stories um, that you both have shared and the perspective. So thank you both for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon and, and stay and, safe. Stay and safe. One, thing that I, one thing that I'd, I'd like to add is that Eric will also share his chocolate cake recipe with everyone. All right, I will do that. <laughs> Even though it's called killer chocolate cake. <laughs> I look forward to that. Thank you so much. Okay. Cynthia and Eric, appreciate Thank it. You. Thank everyone you. Everyone joining us, have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.